Good afternoon, and welcome to a conversation with Joe Caruso. Please welcome your host. Uh, thanks, man. I feel good today. Thank you for uh, being the producer. And I can't see Barbara at all. I just see a white like uh, shadow on the screen. So forgive me, Barbara, if I'm looking away when I'm talking to you, but I can't see you. She um, is now right beside you. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> there you, you are. Me? Now I got you. Yeah, I can see you all. I love okay. this. Good. Looking, looking sharp, man. Thank you. As, as always. Thank you. Um, so I'm I'm very excited about this. Um, now Barbara's not a client, not and uh, and not even a friend. Actually, I don't like her at all. But we, <laughs> we had a prep call and uh, a great call. Really enjoyed the conversation, and um, we just talked about what we wanted to share today. So. We're going to talk kind of the way I would talk to a client, and uh, Barbara's going to teach us about her and what she does, and I'll weigh in every once in a while just to convince. Um, so I like your glasses. Are those new? These are actually my computer glasses, and they have become my primary glasses since COVID. <laughs> yeah, no The kidding. bottom is, you know, backup pair, and who knew that I'd be living in them? But yeah, thank you. I'm glad you like yeah. them. I want to ask you about that coming up, uh, but first, before we do, let's share with the audience uh, what it is you do. And, I, and by the way, set it up. Go ahead. This woman is a genius at setting up elevator pitches and presentations for people, so that you're always presenting yourself in the best light for people understanding who you are, what you offer, what you do, why you're special, and uh, establishes the basis for that that uh, role relationship. You know, Shakespeare and Othello said, uh, we are all merely players. All the world is a stage, we're merely players, each person knowing their part, implying that you don't have to really know the big game, but everybody has to know everybody's role. And Barbara is an expert at helping people understand their best role and then how to best say it. So Barbara, no pressure now that I just said. <laughs> now that you set me up with Shakespeare. Yes. <laughs> Thank uh, you, yeah. Joe. <laughs> it's the bard, you know, it's okay. Well, actually, <laughs> I really, I really like that because there is an element of drama and theater anytime you stand in front of a room. Whether you're pitching, whether you're presenting, you need to be enacting a role in order to communicate who you are and what you do to the world, there you need to watch inflection in the voice. You need to be concentrating on eye contact. You need to be gesturing. So there actually is an element of the bard in, uh, in every presentation that we make. So thank you for bringing that up. It makes sense. Perfect. So, so let's hear how you describe yourself rather than me try to translated from 35,000 feet. <laughs> you probably do a better job. Um, it's, you know, the crazy thing about those of us who are concentrate on clarity and communication, it's all, all always hard for us to be clear. I think any everyone has that challenge that the closer you are to something, the harder it is to get that distance that allows you to really nail it. However, I do describe myself as a communication skills coach. I love working with entrepreneurs. I love working with managers and uh, C-suite type folks. And I love working with academics as well. All of us have messages to get out to the world. And my focus in my coaching is honestly clarity, uh, memorability and impact. So how do we get our messages to stick so that people do remember what we've said, they remember who we are, and they want to engage with us. Does that make sense? Okay, that, that, that was brilliant. And very important because we all see ourselves as really complex animals. And most people don't know themselves. If you ask a person who they are, and you said, but you, which is an easy question, who are, well, you've been around yourself for since birth, but <laughs> you should, but if you take away age, hobby, salary, possessions, friends, family, all things that can change without your permission, God forbid, 
um, and you're still standing here. Who in the hell are you? Who's standing there? You know, it's yeah. funny that you say that because the first time we talked, we talked about Italy. You remember that? You've been there. I've been there. Another flag over your shoulder. There you go. It's back there. Yeah. I lived there for 11 years. But one, that it's so interesting what you just said, because in, in America, we are very used to being asked, who, what do you do? That's, yeah. that's how we define ourselves. But I remember being in Italy and the first time someone asked me, so who are you? Because they will actually ask that question. It's from that being place rather than doing. And I had no answer. <laughs> yeah, I was at my, because we don't answer that question. Uh, we, we think in terms of, now it also it changes in social strata, uh, social strata because, you know, almost everybody has to have a job. So what do you do? But sure. when you get up to the level of people, some of the people I deal with, they did, or they are, they don't identify themselves by their job anymore. So it, 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 it is also not just cultural, but social strata. I, so, yeah, yeah. Now, you did something I want to point out. And this is, this is kind of fun to me. Um, you honored me twice when I asked you that question. You said you, would, you could probably, one of them was, you could probably do a better job. And it wasn't just a toss-off compliment. It was a, a, a nice compliment. Um, because I'm talking to an expert who does this for a living, but you know that I'm also a speaker and a writer. And, and so you're just honoring that aspect of it. And I'm thinking, and I'm going to set this up and then I want you to vamp off. Of it. That's okay. 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 Go. Uh, what came to mind was Shakespeare's uh, Julius Caesar, that play. So we'll stick with Shakespeare just because it seems to be my mind today. And in that speech that Marcus uh, gives in the forum after, well, let me go back. Some people might not know this history. It's, it's a couple weeks old. Uh, we have trouble with a couple weeks old in this country. Um, but Caesar wanted to be emperor. Uh, they accused him of the mortal sin of um, ambition. So he comes into the Senate. Now they've already had a king back in ancient Rome. It didn't go well. So they formed the Senate and they don't want to go back. So he comes in, the woman says to him in the street on the way in, beware the eyes of lunch. Mm. And he walks in and he gets stabbed 37 times. Everyone has to stab him. The last guy is Brutus, his friend. And he says, according to history, and then recounted, recounted by Shakespeare, uh, he, he says, a two boots today, you two boots, Brutus. And he collapses. And then his general comes in, Mark, Mark Anthony comes in, and they look at him. And he sees Caesar on the floor dead, and they've got all their short knives bloodied. And, and they kind of said, How do you want to play this, buddy? Because you could play him, or how do you want to do it? And he says, I understand what you did. I understand why you did it. I would like to be able to present his body to the Roman people in the forum. And I've stood in that spot many, many times where this body was presented. And you know where it is. And I said, uh, uh, so, so he's, they said, well, we're going to have um, uh, Brutus do the uh, oratory before you do. And so he gets up there and he explains that, you know, he wanted to make all of you slaves and he would be the emperor and you would be the slaves to, to Rome. And he lays the case out as it says in Poetics by Aristotle, kind of lawyerly, not really romantically or appealing to the emotion, which is still my point. I know I feel like that sounds like I drift, but that's still my point. And he begins with, I don't care however you identify yourself, I will honor it. And I don't want you to give me anything. I don't want you to trust me. So he starts with this. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. However you see yourself, I'm not telling you to listen. Lend me your ear. Seven words. And you did that very quickly in the introduction. 
because you're you were not only just telling us who you were, but you were displaying, as you talked about, I use the word persona, Brahma, you were displaying how you want to be perceived in the interview. And you did it quite naturally. I think you did it without even thinking. I think it's quite practiced to have just a part of who you are. I don't think it was fake in any way. Can you talk about that a little bit? I think, uh, yeah, I definitely did it without thinking about it because now that you've brought it up, I don't know that I could do it again. Uh, I don't know if I could even pull that off again, but you're right, The this idea of appealing to everyone. It's interesting that it was a Brutus who chose to speak in a lawyerly way. Did I follow that correctly or was it Mark Anthony? No, Mark Anthony appealed to the emotion. Okay, yeah. but Brutus was, he kept it pretty objective. Yeah, in, in Poetics by Aristotle, he says you can present a case in appealing to the other person's, he didn't say nervous system, but basically it's the connection. Mm -hmm. and, or you can lay out a case, fact, 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 therefore. Right, and that's right. Fine. Well, and I think in persuasive communication, we, we probably do a mix because you need to have your logical argument there. You, you know, that I used to have this... Um, feeling that delivery mattered much more than content. And I would say it's 70% delivery. It's only 30% what you say. I've changed my mind about that over the years because I really do think it's almost equal. What you say is very important, but that line, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear, that can be delivered. You know, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ear. Or you could deliver it very flat, or you can really finesse that phrase. However, it's a beautiful, yeah, it's a beautiful phrase, right? It's so, it, so it, it's elegant. Uh, you can you can you can approach your spouse, your lover, your partner, uh, even your dog, and tell them I love you, and it will have a certain meaning. You can whisper it; it'll have a different meaning. You can scream it at them, and it'll have a completely different meaning. So I agree a hundred percent counts there yeah. is a bit you know you've got to sell the song you know any musician knows that tell me um how do you help like if i'm a new client how do you help a new client deliver uh, or formulate a successful pitch that and this is critical because i'm up as you can tell I'm straightforward i'm the same guy you met the last time you talked to me. always going to how how do you help someone do that without having them be on stage, on camera, and a persona that is so far away from who they are that the other person can smell the insincerity? Well, we never want anybody to be insincere. And so the first thing we never do is we never read anything because if you know, pitches cannot be oh, read. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I had that. Okay, I got it. <laughs> You got one, you got that one down because the, the the worst way you can or the worst thing you can do is to sound like you're reciting or reading something to sound insincere because it sounds like you don't know what you're talking about so you always i always as a coach have to work with who that person is everyone has their tics everyone has their difficulties in in, in delivery as i i refer to it some of those things I, as a perfectionist, I'm just going to have to accept because they're not going to be able to stop doing it. There are certain habits or things that people, it's just part of who they are. So what we do is we clean up everything else we can so that that one thing doesn't become, it isn't overly distracting. Yeah. yeah. If we can remove other distractions, for example, if someone... I don't know if I'll be able to think of a good example. Maybe someone ums. That's not an acceptable uh, part of a personality. <laughs> that one has to go because it's very distracting and people can learn not to say um. It is perfectly possible to either train yourself or be trained to stop umming. Okay. But possibly their gestures are maybe a little less intentional than I would like. I would accept the less intentional gesturing uh, if I can get rid of the umming for them. Something of everyone's personality has to remain. So, so, so you work with each client understanding their personal proclivities. One of the right. things 
of my new book is we are a pattern of our personal proclivities. Oh, I like that. Some of, well, I love the alliteration, but, but some of the, <laughs> some of our personal proclivities should be regulated because they don't yes. serve us. And so you as the coach would help them regulate the personal proclivities that they can regulate. And you've had enough experience to be able to know which ones can and which ones can't. Yeah, and with, in working with someone over some time, I'm gonna figure that out too, because if it's something that they really have difficulty getting rid of or managing, then we know, okay, that's a personal proclivity and we're gonna live with that one. But it's, it's, so it's getting to know the person, getting to know, and one thing I deal a lot with is intonation pattern. Some people have that up in their intonation that, that robs them of credibility. It robs the them end, of- The end it, of a sentence? Yes. They go up at the end of most sentences. I'm working with someone right now, a young lady who has to give a presentation in a couple of weeks for her company. So she's gonna be representing the face of the company and she should be viewed as an expert on the topic. But right now she has this pretty strong tendency to, to use up and very high pitched intonation in certain points in her phrases. And her assignment for this week was to go back and listen to her video and see if she could hear that. Because until oh. someone can hear it, they can't fix it. You can't regulate anything you're not aware of. Exactly, exactly. That, that's a great approach. When I work with clients in their minds, I understand that for them to first, they have to understand the proclivity and understand, and then they have to see how it manifests in their life. And once they see that without me pointing it out, mm -hmm. just making them aware of it in other ways, then they could decide if it's something they want to change or shift. Right. I, one, one, of the, one of the rules that I teach CEOs to not sound rehearsed, but also not sound dismissive. Mm -hmm. I, Notice in Ronald Reagan in 84 and then in Bill Clinton later. So real quick, and, and don't tell me you're not old enough to remember these people. Oh, I'm plenty and old enough to remember them. I know you don't remember, but you studied them in history class when you were six. Oh, no, so, Joe. I was there. <laughs> so they would ask Reagan, the cowboy, you know, the, the comfortable, the congenial Southern California cavalier man. They would ask him a question. And he would go, well, and he did that to show consideration. Mm -hmm. Instead of jumping on the last word of the question, because I've already got the answer and damn it, listen to me. Yeah. Now, later on, Clinton did the exact same thing, but nobody ever wrote about it. But he did it differently, just a little differently. He bit his lip like this. The question and he'd go, Mm. then he'd answer the question that's interesting so both were not jumping to say let me show you how smart i am or let me let me try to impress you it was to honor the other person in consideration of their question but you actually thought about it right that's you, interesting you, it's very much part of japanese culture that they will always leave a silence after the other person has spoken to acknowledge what that person has said and to really be giving it consideration. It, and it's not such a pattern in other, in other cultures' behavior or other cultures' communication behavior. And many cultures interrupt each other and don't even allow the person to finish their what phrase. See, I is could, that the we know who we're talking about here, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but you're exactly on the money on this one. And so it, 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 is, it is cultural in that regard. I try to help clients understand, especially leaders. I want my leaders to speak last, not first, mm -hmm. because then they, found they foundationally own the context mm -hmm. that everybody else now has to think about because we're social animals we're like dogs we're not like cats and and so i also ask them to please wait three seconds mm -hmm. after the reason i do that is most people don't listen or think very well before they speak 
there's an emotional drive to get out what they want to get out. There's insecurity behind it, sometimes fear, sometimes anger, uh, all kinds of things wrapped up, and they want to win the day with what they say. So well, I, so often people are thinking about what do I want to say next? They're thinking about their response. There's that very, most people don't listen to listen or to understand. Most people listen to respond. So if you're, and this happens to foreign language speakers, you know, they're thinking, they're trying to find the words in whatever language it is to yep. give the response. So that happens to all of us when we're speaking a second language. But when it's our first language, we ought to make that attempt to listen to understand. Exactly right. And the more, the more we can understand that if you pause three seconds, now we're not doing this because I'm not the leader, you're not the leader, we're conversing. Mm -hmm. But if someone finishes that works on my leadership team, say, I'd say pause three seconds because in their mind, they're instantly reviewing, did I really say the essence of what I wanted to say? Because most times we don't. And then they get a chance to add on. Let them keep tagging on. And you let them keep tagging on. And let them keep tagging. And pretty soon you're going to hear what they actually wanted to tell you <laughs> instead of what they puked out in the moment. And yeah, now what I have like. Well, I like that what you said about I want my leaders to speak last because then they have all of this context to work with. And if they've really been listening to what the other people have said, they might say something completely different than they thought they were going to say when they went into the meeting because they didn't have all of that information. Absolutely right. Before we take some questions, and then we'll do that in just a minute, I have one last question. So we change glasses because of post-COVID, you're on the computer all the time. Yep. Got it. What else should people know about how to communicate post-COVID as we do more Zoom calls and less in-person meetings? Well, there's you know, we've all gotten more used to Zoom, I think, but there are some things to still keep in mind. Uh, you and I have pretty much been doing this throughout the call, but you want to stay fairly still in the frame. Uh, moving around a lot and wiggling and I've been in, on calls where people have been moving around and yeah that doesn't go well on zoom because all we've got is this postage stamp and we have no choice but to look each, at each other like this so if you're doing a lot of distracting things with your with your body it's even I don't recommend doing that even in person but it's even more uh, it's more distracting in this context I think the other thing to keep in mind eye contact is really tricky on zoom you and I, like right now, you're to my right. I'm looking over here because I'm not looking here at the camera because your face is over here and we all want to look at the other person's face. The But when you need to say something particularly impactful, whether it be delivering some negative feedback or constructive feedback, we can say um, something that you really need people to believe you're sincere about, you need to look at the green dot. That's the moment in which you need to nail that eye contact because that's like, you I'm feel like I'm, do you feel like I'm looking at you right now? Exactly, yeah, in the eye. Yeah, exactly. Whereas over here, I'm not, if I'm looking over here where you are. So that you can't, we can't go through an entire Zoom interaction looking at the green dot <laughs> because it's, it's just too hard to do when the face is over here. However, think about the moments in which you need to, to really make that eye connection and based on what you would need to say or listen to, I would say there are moments when the other person is speaking and you want them to really know you're listening, that's when you look at the green dot. I didn't know that, that's things. good. Really, really, really good advice. Um, I, I enjoyed the conversation. So it was very helpful for me, I learned. And-, oh, and uh, about Shakespeare. <laughs> I learned about Shakespeare. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Came up. I don't know. I didn't have that one planned. Um, the uh, we'll, we'll see if, if the producer has any questions coming in from the audience. I, I want to make a little plug too. People have been giving advice about you should interview this person or you should cover these questions or what. Send it in, man. Also, there's conversations with Joe, which is this is now. It's going to be on the website. Plug in, we listen to everything, we advise, we laugh at you, but we listen, we listen. <laughs> so, um, so Mike, I don't know if we have anything yet. 
We had a, a question that came in that wanted to inquire the difference in an elevator pitch, the pause to make your point versus the pause between speakers at a conference. And if you're doing a 30 second elevator pitch, is there too many pauses? Is there a number that you should work on? And do they mean like if they're 30 second pitches, there'll be a lot of pauses between speakers? Not between speakers, the pause to accent the main point of their elevator pitch. What's hmm. the difference between the pause in accenting your point versus the pause between speakers? It's shorter, <laughs> I would say. I want to weigh in on this too. So please, I want to hear what you have to say. I'm going to put it in a different context, but I love, I'd love to hear this. Well, I would just say that a pause to make your point in a 30 second pitch, you don't want it to be too long because you don't have very much time to get your points across. So those pauses would be brief, but impactful. But pause between speakers, I would say would be probably about five seconds or it depends on how much time it takes to change to the other speaker. So I think the difference would be one of length. That's my input. Joe? I, I couldn't agree more. I can also weigh in on if I'm speaking to 10,000 people, which means most people are seeing you on a screen versus the little amp that's on the stage, you can't move around too much then either because it's back to the screen and it gets very dizzying for them. And, it, and I always think, as a musician, the pause done properly makes people listen a little bit more to what you're about to say because they yeah. think you've thought it out, it's more important. So I couldn't agree more. Barbara, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm really sorry we only have more time because I really enjoy it. I know I've enjoyed it too. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And I'm going to use you. I'm going to make a plug while you're here, please. Uh, 42821. I'm talking to Daniel Marcos at three o'clock Eastern time. Brilliant guy. Very successful. Really had a great pre-call with them. And oh, there it is right there on your screen. And thanks, White. And, uh, and lots to learn from him as well. Barbara, you, you helped us and thank you very much and keep doing what you're doing and good luck. Thank you very much, Joe. It's been such a pleasure to meet you and I am still reading your book. I'm enjoying it. Oh, I'm so glad. I, I knew that you're the one. Got it. <laughs> oh, ciao, Bella. Ciao, ciao. I stopped in piacere. Grazie, piacere mio. Thank you everyone for attending. And that concludes a conversation with Joe Caruso with guest Barbara Bolt. Have a great week.